Small Spaces, 7. It was still raining by the time they got done with homeroom. Ollie had listened to the announcements with half an ear, fingers itching for her book. She could still hear Mr. Easton's voice saying, They never found any bodies. But Ollie didn't have time to read yet. They were going to the farm. The bell rang and the sixth grade piled outside, pulling on caps and coats and backpacks. The bus squatted in the middle of the wet parking lot like a prehistoric swamp monster, the two golden eyes of its headlights gleaming out through the fog. Mr. Easton popped out of the door, bus door and the swamp monster illusion dissolved. Hurry up, he shouted, waving his arm. The sixth grade hurried through the rain. Already rows of faces peered through the bus's misted up windows. Ollie splashed across the puddled parking lot, cradling her book under her rain jacket. The bus was steamy warm. There you are, Ollie, said Mr. Easton. Ollie didn't answer. She was frowning at the bus driver. He was big, with a thick gray beard. In fact, he was sort of gray all over. Gray-white. Mushroom-colored. Except his lips were red. He gave her a shifting sideways grin. Ollie decided she didn't like his grin. "'Where's Miss Hodges?' she asked. Miss Hodges was their usual bus driver. She had been driving Evansburg school buses for forever. She would call students by their older siblings' names and sometimes ask Ollie with a vaguely sympathetic tone what she was reading. Resting, said this bus driver. Ollie, for no reason at all, thought of the skeleton in the Brewster's attic lurching down the stairs. Had to rest, did Miss Hodges. Ollie, said Mr. Easton, first of all, be polite. Second of all, find a seat. It's time to go. Mr. Jones, was it, works on the farm. He very kindly volunteered to take over for Miss Hodges. Such beautiful misty weather. What an adventure we'll have today, hmm? Holly, not being part walrus, did not like bad weather. Also, the bus driver didn't seem much like a Mr. Jones to her, but Mr. Easton was getting impatient. Ollie peered down the aisle. There were no empty seats, except... No, really? The only empty spot was next to Brian Battersby. Well, sort of empty. Even though Brian wasn't that big, he took up most of the seat, sprawling and joking with his two friends in front of him. Why wasn't one of them sitting next to him? Hockey stars didn't sit by themselves. Ollie marched down the aisle. Coco Zintner was sitting next to Monica Dameron, who had headphones on and was ignoring her. Coco was scribbling in her sparkly notebook. Ollie glanced down saw that the notebook was open to a drawing of a chessboard with a lot of arrows and cutouts. This surprised Ollie. In her mind, Coco Zintner and chess diagrams didn't go together. Ollie looked closer. Coco's drawing was a picture of an endgame, the last few moves of a match. The white side was losing. Before she could stop herself, Ollie muttered, White castle to h6 and mate in five moves. The new girl jumped, looking at her paper, then looked up at Ollie. A sunrise of open-mouthed delight dawned on her face. In fact, she looked so happy that it made Ollie feel snappish, obviously, she added. Snappish because of memory. Her mother had been a math professor at Evansburg College. She had taught Ollie math with games, multiplication, division, later algebra, and then geometry. Symbols like magic spells written on the skin of the world. She would entertain Ollie on hikes by setting her a problem at the, trailha at the trailhead and asking for an answer at the top of the mountain. 
One night, Ollie had overheard her mom whisper to her dad, Well, Olivia is better than I was at her age. Let's try her on music and chess. They often go with math. They had put the upright piano in the entryway of the egg, the only place it would fit, and Ollie had begun plinking out songs. They had given her a chess set, and Ollie still remembered the taste of triumph, the celebratory piece of apple pie, on the evening she'd first beaten her mom without having been spotted a piece. But the piano had sat silent for nearly a year now, and Ollie's dad wasn't good at chess. Coco took no notice of Ollie's tone. You play chess? she said, shrill with delight. Ollie supposed Coco had a right to be surprised. Coco hadn't known Ollie before. Coco was so excited she had begun to wrinkle the paper on her lap. Want to play? I don't have a set, but we can call it... No, said Ollie. But... Coco drooped at once. Gotta go. Ollie beat a hasty retreat down the aisle of the bus and halted next to Brian. Move, she said. Mike Campbell and Free Fred Phil Greenblatt peered interestedly over the seat in front. Brian looked like he was trying extra hard to be cool. What if I don't want to, Ollie Pop? That dumb nickname. Her ears burned. Not my problem, Ollie retorted. It's not my fault you're wider than you are tall. Mike and Phil laughed. Brian, to Ollie's surprise, suddenly slid over. Was it her imagination, or was he looking embarrassed too? All yours, he said. Ollie sat down, keeping a suspicious eye on Brian. First he got her out of detention, and now he was... A thought struck her. Did you save me a seat? she asked. What? said Brian. He was definitely red about the ears. No. She eyed him. He turned studiously to look out the window. Ollie stared and then shrugged. Let boys be a mystery for another day. There was the mystery of her book in front of her. Ollie opened up small spaces. John, I said, what are you going to do? Go with him, said Jonathan, his voice thick with despair. I promised, in exchange for Caleb, I have to go, or, or he'll take Caleb instead. We made a bargain, you see, but it might not be for long. He tried to sound reassuring, but I don't think even he believed it, until the mist becomes rain. What does that mean? I don't know, but... Beth, he kept his side of the bargain. Caleb died the night I told him you and I were engaged. I trembled. No, no, he didn't. John, you're not thinking properly. Of course he didn't die. He came home. He came home three nights later. Yes, said John, because the smiling man and I made a bargain. I think he knew he was getting the better end of the deal, and that is why he smiled. Caleb died thirty years ago, and now I have to go into the mist. What are you reading, Ollie? asked Brian. Ollie looked up. Was Brian trying to be nice again? People's parents did sometimes tell their kids to be nice to that girl, because you know what happened to the poor thing? The thought put a nasty edge in her voice when she answered, Are you blind? A book. Ah, said Brian. He angled his head to get a look at the book's cover. What book? I've never seen it before. Did you get it from the library? How would you know what's in the library? Ollie thought. It's called Small Spaces, she said, biting off each word. She lifted the cover to show him, which you could read for yourself, if you could read. Usually, one nasty remark was enough to put people off being nice. There was a small silence. Well, 
I only learned reeling and writhing, Brian said conversationally to the top of her head. And then the different branches of arithmetic, ambition, distraction, uglification, and derision. What? Ollie knew where she'd heard that sentence before. She could feel her mouth sagging open in a way that she didn't think people did in real life. Mystery, ancient, and modern, Brian went on, leaning back in his seat, looking smug, with seography, then drawling, but whoops, they forgot reading. Sorry to bug you. And with that, he leaned forward to join the conversation between Mike and Phil. Yeah, when he took that third shot and faked the goalie left. You might get to know characters in books, Ollie thought. But getting to know a human was an entirely different thing. She tried to keep reading, but couldn't. Her mom's voice was lodged in her brain too deeply to be forgettable. You were rude, Olivia, said her mother's voice. You judged him, and he didn't deserve it. Ollie told herself she didn't care. Yes, she did. She shut her book, a finger holding the page. It's about a girl named Beth, she said to Brian. She lives on an old farm called Smoky Hollow, sort of like Misty Valley. Then Ollie couldn't resist asking, Have you memorized Alice in Wonderland? Not really, bits, said Brian, looking cautious, as though he were admitting to something too weird for a hockey star. I just like the words in that part. I can tell you most of Jabberwocky, if you like, for all the good it will do you. He stopped talking. Ollie had stopped listening. She was looking past him, out through the curtains of rain. Who was that? A little boy in a brown coat, standing just at the edge of the cornfield? But his face was still and colorless. Who is that? Ollie said, pointing. Brian turned his head to follow her finger. I don't see anything. He looked like, no, what was she thinking? It was just a scarecrow in a suit. Ollie didn't like scarecrows. When the light was weird, like now in the rain, they almost looked alive. Stupid scarecrows. Never mind, Ollie said. They passed a sign, Misty Valley Farm and Gardens. In the last moments before the bus rolled to a stop, Ollie paged back to the book's epigraph. Avoid large places at night. Ollie touched the words wishing she understood. The sun was coming out. The rain had slowed to a drizzle. Thick, surprising sunbeams slanted through the clouds. The bus turned in the farm gate. They parked in a big gravel parking lot and the engine cut out. A few people had put down their windows when the rain stopped. The smell of cows and garlic floated in. The students filed off the bus. When she got to the front, Ollie glanced sideways toward the bus driver. To her surprise, he was gone. The tall woman was waiting at the bus door, directing the kids as they came off. She wore a plaid shirt and muddy boots. Ollie saw her and froze. Linda Webster owner of Misty Valley Farms was the woman from yesterday, the woman whose book Ollie had stolen.